our gospel lesson, a single verse from Luke chapter 2. Oftentimes, it can get missed over on New Year's Day because it's not always that often that we always have, that we have a service on New Year's Day. But it reads, on the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. And this is our text. I think it's kind of fortunate that New Year's Day rarely falls on a Sunday. One, you had to change worship schedules. Uh, Two, think about it, all of those people who stayed up late last night in order to greet the new year are maybe in no condition to worship today. Although I do understand that there may be a few who could be heard this morning moaning, oh God, oh God, oh God. (laughs) And then, of course, today there's football, which for many people is the real religion in our land. And New Year's Day is always a day of worship for the football devotee. But here you are in the house of God. And I give thanks for that. And this, of course, is where we ought to begin a new year. I'd like to begin by telling you about a Christmas pageant that was presented by a class of four-year-olds, and it certainly was an evening to remember. It began with the three Virgin Marys marching out onto the stage, And as they stood there, of course, they were waving to their parents. I mean, it's not every Christmas pageant that has three Virgin Marys, but over the year, the school had acquired three Mary costumes, and so, quite naturally, the script was revised. And this gave a chance for more children to be involved, and it kept down the squabbling over who got to have the starring roles. And then the two Josephs walked up behind the Marys. And then 20 little angels came out. And they were dressed in white robes and huge gauze wings. And they were followed by 20 little shepherd boys dressed in burlap sacks. And they carried an array of objects that were supposed to be shepherd's crooks. And you see, it was at this point that the problem occurred. You see, during the, during the dress rehearsal, the teacher had used chalk to draw circles on the floor to mark where the angels were supposed to stand and crosses to mark where the shepherds were supposed to stand. But the children had practiced with their regular clothes on. And so on the night of the pageant, the angels came walking out with their beautiful gauze wings and they stood on their circles. However, their huge wings covered the crosses of the shepherds as well. So when the time came for the shepherds to find their places, they didn't know where to go because the angels took up all of their space. And there was one tiny boy who became extremely frustrated and angry over the whole experience. And he finally spied his teacher behind the curtains and he shocked everyone when he said in a loud stage whisper, heard by everyone, because of those blankety blank angels, I can't find the cross. And he didn't say (laughs) blankety-blank. But we'll let it go at that. But the thing is, I can't help but wonder sometimes if that can't happen. You know, we have all the romantic elements of Christmas. The shepherd, 
the wise men, the angels, the star in the east, not to mention the commercialism of Christmas. And you see, all of those things have a tendency to obscure the important meaning of it all, and particularly the message of the cross. And I think that's why it's healthy for us on this New Year's Day, which we as a church celebrate as the circumcision and the name of our Lord Jesus, that we would turn to the prologue of John's Gospel. You see, there are no angels, no shepherds, no star, not even Mary and Joseph. Instead, John's Gospel begins with some of those most beautiful and important theological language that was ever written. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. You see, no shepherds, no angels, no stars. Yet here, ultimately, is the story of Christmas. And this story says, first of all, that Christmas is not an act of humanity, but it's an act of God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. Do you see, when we could do nothing for ourselves, God stepped in to save us. And think about that, the verse. He was called Jesus. Remember, it was the, angel, the, word, the name given by the angel. Jesus, Savior. For he is the one who took on humanity, who became one of us in order to be our Savior. And the story says in the second place that God acted in the only way that God could act. I mean, why else could the darkness not understand him? Why did the world not receive him? And the problem, well, maybe the problem is pretty clear. God is spirit. Have you ever seen a spirit? God is the creator of the universe, a universe that might be billions of light years wide. Can you even begin to imagine a being of that extraordinary power and knowledge? How could God even speak to us without, our, without scaring us to death? I want you to pretend that something like this happened for a moment. The angel Gabriel got back to heaven and he rushed up to God and he said, I've got good news and I've got bad news. And God said, well, give me the good news first. And the good news is, said the angel, mission accomplished. I've visited those people that you told me to visit. And I told them what you told me to tell them, and it's all accomplished. And God said, so what's the bad news? The bad news, the angel said, is that those people down there on earth are terrified of you. Every time I visited someone, I had to start off with fear not, because they were so frightened that you were coming close. And God said to the angel, that's the reason that I have to carry out the plan that I've made. You see, he said to the angel, I need to go to earth because my people are so frightened. They're so full of fear that I've got to bring the message that they no longer need 
to be afraid. And the angel said, and how are you going to do that since they're so fearful? And God said, well, there's one place on earth that people are not afraid. And that one remaining place is a little baby. My people on earth are not afraid of a baby. And when a baby is born, they rejoice and they give thanks without fear because that's the only place that's left in their lives where they're not afraid. You see, God acted in the only way that God could act without overwhelming us and taking away our freedom. God became a tiny babe. You see, God knew right from the beginning what he was doing. God gave us what we most needed. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed on his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And that's who we are, children of God. And when we know that, then the meaning and the purpose of life changes. Marjorie Talcott was married and had one child during the Great Depression. And the family, well, they managed to scrape through. But as Christmas approached one year, Marjorie and her husband were disappointed that they wouldn't be able to buy any presents. And a week before Christmas, they explained to their six-year-old son, Pete, that there weren't going to be any store-bought presents this Christmas. But I'll tell you what we can do, said Pete's father. We can make pictures of the presents that we'd like to give each other. And so that was a busy week. And Marjorie and her husband set to work. And Christmas Day arrived. And the family rose to find their skimpy little tree made magnificent by the picture presents that adorned it. There was luxury beyond imagination in those pictures. There was a black limousine and a red speedboat for dad. There was a diamond bracelet and a fur coat for mom. There was a camping tent and a swimming pool for Pete. And then Pete pulled out his present. It was a crayon drawing of a man, a woman, and a child with their arms around each other, laughing. And under the picture was just one word, us. You see, Pete's card summed it, summed it up. Us, the love and the security of a family. It's the kind of picture that God presents to us today as we stand here at the threshold of a new year. The baby, our Savior, one of us. And in this first act of placing him, being placed under the law, which he came to fulfill for us, he shed his blood maybe foreshadowing the blood that would be shed some 30-some years later on the cross. But the baby Jesus, who came down, who became one of us. You know, God doesn't tell us what, the, what this year that's ahead of us is going to hold. But God does reveal the one who will hold you in his loving arms. And so, contrary to most of what you've been seeing on TV and the message of the world, I'm not talking today about weight loss. I'm not talking about exercise. And I'm not talking about all kinds of resolutions. But what I want to bring you is a message of hope and peace and comfort and joy. Because it says to us that we are God's own children. That we don't need to fear anything because we belong to God. And I wish all of you a very 
blessed new year.